So in this video, I want to talk about the regulation of fatty acid synthesis. And there is a particular regulated enzyme of fatty acid synthesis, and we've actually mentioned it before. What was that enzyme? That enzyme was acetyl-CoA carboxylase. What did it do? Well, it catalyzed the committed step in fatty acid synthesis, which is this one right here. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase catalyzes this reaction, right? The activation of acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, which is the molecule committed to fatty acid synthesis. So this enzyme is regulated in by, via two ways, right? Covalent modification, which is actually hormonally influenced, which is talked about a little bit in the next video. And it's also regulated allosterically. One more thing is that malonyl-CoA being the molecule that is committed to fatty acid synthesis, it actually inhibits beta oxidation and fatty acid degradation. And it does that specifically by inhibiting, oops, inhibiting CAT1 or CPT1, which is carnitine acyltransferase 1 or carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1. If you recall, that's the protein involved in transporting activated acyl CoAs from the cytosol into the mitochondrial matrix for beta oxidation. So malonyl-CoA, being the molecule committed to fatty acid synthesis, stops that. It blocks that uh, process from happening. It stops fatty acyl-CoAs from getting into the mitochondrial matrix for beta oxidation, so beta oxidation cannot even come close to happening. And that makes sense, right? Because you don't want fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid degradation to be occurring at the same time. Okay. So let's see what we got here. So up here in the top left, we've got acetyl-CoA carboxylase in its T state, right? It's inactive form, okay? And its inactive form is actually phosphorylated. So its inactive form is carrying a phosphate. And that's not something that we normally see, but it can happen. Um, uh, in order to activate it, in order to get it into its R form, its active state, what has to happen is that the phosphate needs to be removed by protein phosphatase 2A. So that will give us acetyl-CoA carboxylase in its active form. So to get back to that inactive form, a protein, uh, uh, or excuse me, the, um, a protein kinase needs to be added to add that phosphate back on from ATP. And that's, that kinase specifically is AMP activated protein kinase. So this protein is activated by AMP, which is, um, which is adenosine monophosphate, which is an indicator of low energy, and we'll, mention, we'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. And it's activated by AMP, but inhibited by ATP. Some of you might be thinking that's kind of weird. Well, if it's inhibited by ATP, then why is ATP used in this reaction? Kind of weird, right? And I totally agree. But um, the idea is that, like, regardless, uh, if if there's um, if there's high ATP, um, or excuse me, if there's a uh, high AMP, this reaction will be active. There's high AMP, right? This AMP activated protein kinase. That still uses an ATP. So even if there's, uh, even if it's like we don't have very much ATP, there might be enough around to, to, uh, to, you know, to be used for this reaction to give us this uh, inactive carboxylase. And we'll talk more about what this all means in terms of high and low energy states in just a moment. So up here, this was the covalent modification and how that plays a role, okay, right? Because we're making or breaking a covalent bond to, um, with this phosphate group right here. It's attached, and here we're removing it, and moving back to the left, we're adding that phosphate back on. Now, over here to the left is the allosteric control, okay, the allosteric control. Now, this, this inactive uh, carboxylase with the phosphate on it can be regulated um, or one of its allosteric regulators is citrate. In fact, citrate is an activator, and when it attaches, it gives you an acetyl-CoA carboxylase that is at least partially active. It's not as active as the acetyl-CoA carboxylase um, that, d that doesn't have the phosphate group attached, but it is more active than this T state up here. Um, so this is like an R form that's not as active as this R form. So citrate here is an activator, right? It's an activator of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, an allosteric activator to be specific. And over here, we've got um, palmitate or palmitoyl-CoA, palmitoyl-CoA as an inhibitor that stabilizes the T state, the inactive state. So let's ask ourselves, 
a little bit about this situation. Questions to consider. When would we want acetyl-CoA carboxylase to be active? Well, acetyl-CoA carboxylase is the enzyme that catalyzes the committed step of fatty acid synthesis. Okay, so the question is, when do we want this enzyme active, and when do we want fatty acid synthesis active? It's the same thing, right? If, we get, if this enzyme is active, fatty acid synthesis is happening. Well, fatty acid synthesis is an anabolic, oops, I don't want to use purple, white. So it's an anabolic reaction, and it requires energy. And it's a prerequisite to building and storing fat, or storing energy as fat. So the real question is, when would we want to store energy, right? Well, when we've got plenty of it, right? When we've got plenty of energy. So this is under conditions of high ATP. So this is when we would want the acetyl-CoA carboxylase active. So let's take a look at that. We should have the, it's, the enzyme should be active under high ATP conditions. Well, where is ATP here? Right here. So this AMP activated protein kinase is inhibited by ATP. This kinase um, adds a phosphate to the to the carboxylase to give you the inactive form. When we have lots of ATP, we don't want the the acetyl CoA carboxylase to be inactive. We want it to be active, so so as to store that energy. <coughs> Excuse me. So the ATP will s inhibit the process that inactivates the acetyl-CoA carboxylase. It wants the, the carboxylase to remain in its active form, not to be phosphorylated back into the inactive form. Now on the flip side, when would we want acetyl-CoA carboxylase and fatty acid synthesis to be inactive? Well, under the opposite scenario, when we don't have plenty of energy, and instead, we want fatty acid breakdown to occur, right? Which is, of course, beta oxidation. If if we don't have a lot of energy, we want to make more energy, and we can do that. We can't do that by storing fats. We can do it by breaking them down. So we would want the the um, the the carboxylase enzyme to be inactive when we want when we want the uh, fatty acid breakdown or beta oxidation to occur, and this would create more energy. So this would happen under low energy conditions, which would be high AMP and low ATP. So we just saw up there that the high AMP activates the AMP activated protein kinase, right? So that'll um, phosphorylate the acetyl-CoA carboxylase, giving us an inactive um, carboxylase enzyme. That way, fatty acid synthesis is not going to occur under low energy conditions. It would only occur under high energy conditions. So those first two questions kind of refer to the covalent modification. What about the allosteric stuff? So why does citrate allosterically activate the carboxylase, and why does that make any sense? Well, kind of have to ask yourself, when are citrate levels high? Well, what does citrate come from? We know that citrate synthase gives us citrate from acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate. And if there's a bunch of acetyl-CoA uh, around, if there's a bunch of acetyl-CoA around, that means there's a lot of that substrate around to make citrate. So if there's a high levels of citrate, that could indicate that acetyl-CoA levels are high because citrate comes from acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate, of course, but we're not worried about that here. Uh, another thing is that when citrate levels are high when ATP levels are high. And you might be thinking, well, how does that kind of work? Well, when we have um, glycolysis occurring and giving us pyruvate, and pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA, um, glycolysis is giving us energy. This acetyl-CoA is going to be oxidized, can be oxidized for energy, um, and um, that will give us a bunch of ATP. Also, Beta oxidation gives us cleaves off a bunch of uh, acetyl CoA's that give us um, in the process of giving us NADHs and FADH2s, which also give us ATP. So when when we have high ATP around, that's usually because we have a lot of acetyl CoA around that's being oxidized for energy. So what I'm really getting at here is that citrate levels are high. When they're high, that that indicates acetyl CoA levels and ATP levels are high. And if there's a lot of acetyl-CoA and a lot of ATP, what are these substrates for? 
Well, these are substrates for fatty acid synthesis. So if there's a lot of these guys, that means that, that we have the availability of the substrates for fatty acid synthesis. So if citrate is an indicator of lots of substrates around for fatty acid synthesis, then it could, at least to some extent, activate the carboxylase to have fatty acid synthesis occur. So that explains that. This last question down here. What about this palmitoyl CoA or palmitate? What's its role in all of this? And um, why would it favor the inactive um, carboxylase? Well, think about what do what does palmitoyl CoA or high levels of palmitate indicate? Well, what is palmitate? Palmitate is a fatty acid. If there's a bunch of, bunch of it, that indicates a bunch of fatty acid around, right? If there's lots of fatty acid around, do you need to make more? No, you don't need to commit to making more if there's already plenty of it. So, palmitoyl CoA, right, a fatty acid, would say, hey, don't make more fatty acids, and it'll stabilize the T state of acetyl CoA carboxylase. So, palmitoyl CoA actually plays uh, multiple roles. It doesn't just do that, it also inhibits uh, two other things. It inhibits the translocase that allows uh, citrates passage from the mitochondria out to the cytosol. So that's acetyl CoA transport, right? Um, the citrate in the mitochondria needs to get out to the cytosol and then be cleaved to oxaloacetate and acetyl CoA to free up acetyl CoA in the cytosol. Palmitate stops that. It doesn't allow that to happen. So what does that do? That makes it so that acetyl CoA won't be transported to the cytosol for fatty acid synthesis. Right? If the if the citrate can't get out, then then you won't get any acetyl CoA in the cytosol. So that means acetyl CoA won't be available for fatty acid synthesis in the cytosol. Another thing that palmitate inhibits <laughs> inhibits <laughs> palmitate inhibits uh, glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase of the pentose phosphate pathway. And what's that important for? Glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase that gives you NADPH, right? So there's less production of NADPH if that enzyme is inhibited. So this means that you have less acetyl-CoA, less NADPH, and those are both things that are required for fatty acid synthesis, right? Uh, palmitate stops stops the availability of those substrates um, uh, in in because it's going to stop fatty acid synthesis from occurring. So it stops fatty acid synthesis in in sort of a triple whammy, right? It not only allosterically inactivates car acetyl CoA carboxylase, but it also inhibits the translocase, the uh, citrates translocase, and it also in inhibits um, glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase, which um, leads to less availability of the substrates for fatty acid synthesis. Hope that video was helpful. Thank you for watching.